Hi, thank you for joining me today. My name is Mark Bader and I'm a second year student at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Today we're going to be interviewing Dr. Scott Colonna and Dr. John Armando. And we're going to be exploring the different aspects of optometry to prove to you that there is more to business than better one or better two. So, I want to ask you today, how do you set yourself apart from others and make yourself a better optometrist than anyone else? Yeah, Mark, that, that's a great first question, uh, because I think Scott and I, we never really thought of uh, competing with other optometrists. So the only competition that, that we ever made was sort of with ourselves. Uh, and uh, we, we don't try to be better than others necessarily. We just try to continue to better ourselves over time. Um, we want really all optometrists to do well very well. And there's room for that. There are so many people in this country and uh, the competition between optometrists really doesn't have to happen. Uh, you know, I look at it almost as, uh, you know, like your group of friends, right? So, you know, when your group of friends, the reason why you're friends is because everyone wants to kind of help each other out and everyone leans on you know, each other, but if you had a group of friends that all they wanted to do was be better than you, how would you feel, right? Like, it's kind of like, you don't want to be hanging out with a group of people who all they want to do is be better than you, right? right. So it's just, you want to you want to be in their company, and, uh, you know, you want it to be easy, and you, you want uh, really all of optometry to sort of be a close-knit group. Now, does that happen? No. <laughs> it doesn't happen really uh, at this point. Sometimes it does, um, but we hope that over time that sort of thing improves. And if we can get that word out, you know, that would be a great thing. So in terms of, I guess, my question is more so in, in terms of like making sure that you're capable of pulling in those uh, patients and what they see different from you versus other optometrists. Right. And why they choose you. Right. Um, it, it's it's very cliche, but it does come down to kind of a customer service point of view where um, you really have to bring in the patients and they need to feel as though they're extended family um, or friends, uh, and they always have to leave happy. And it's, it's very simple. We used to you know, write that on the board. That was our motto right off the bat. We had it for years and years and years. I'm shocked it's actually not yeah. here right now on our board. Um, but for 15 years, we just had every patient leaves happy. And it's, it's these simple types of things and just kind of being genuine uh, and, and showing the value that we have. It's not, not, a, not no magic dust there. Like yeah, it's in model model model. Model. definitely one for the... Uh, so one for the whiteboard. There you go. Um, Dr. Colonna, um, what is the process of buying into or opening a group practice? Mm -hmm. How would you go about doing that? So, you know, I speak to a lot of students about this topic. Obviously, it's a very important topic. And, you know, from buying into a practice, you need to approach, is that a fit for you as a person? Right? Everybody has their own values or core values and buying in and becoming a partner with another group of, of doctors that have been practicing, it's really important to have in-depth conversations about the goals uh, for the practice and the goals personally, right? Because you want to align yourself with someone who is on the same page as you, right? That gives you the best chance of success. From there, the technical parts would be actually appraising, getting the practice appraised so you can know a true value of the practice. And then discussing after that appraisal comes out what is really acceptable for you, say, buying into it, into the partnership, into a group, and, and how we're going to contractually put that on paper and then finance it. Is the financing going to be paid off from you taking a decreased salary? Is it going to be from an outside source where you're going to be expected to provide a lump sum of money up front to them so that you're a partner at that percentage right off the bat, right? Uh, so there's two different ways that it can be structured. It could be something where you 
pay off a small amount each year and then you gain shares in the company over time or you put down a large lump sum uh, adding probably to what most of the students have student debt and all these other things where can you borrow more money from uh, to become a partner but that allows you to have those shares up front and be involved in the decision making process a little bit more right so those are the things you want to consider because paying it off slowly over time your voice not may not be heard in that practice for a number of years so those are the things that we discuss with students that are looking to buy into a practice or practitioners that are looking to take on a partner you know uh, you cannot take partnership lightly i mean john and i have been doing this for a number of years you know uh 17 plus uh, and it's 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 not easy we don't agree on a lot of things actually you know uh, and i've said this before we've had discussions where he feels strongly about one way i feel strongly about the other way we have you know pretty heated discussions about things and we go home disagreed and upset with each other but the next day we come in and it's work as usual right we put that behind us because we have to make decisions so that's an important thing to align yourself with someone that you could have those true heated discussions at times and be honest with them to grow the business right that's the goal so yeah that's uh that's a good point dr uh, Armando. Um, so, if you were in a situation, unfortunately, it happens in all businesses where a patient is not compliant, or they're arguing with you and making such a fuss about whatever the issue is, how would you most, how would you most efficiently and effectively go about taking care of that situation? Yeah. Uh, to me, it's a time issue. So, a you have to notice when that's about to happen. You need to have staff members be able to figure that out now in real life most people have that sense right um but sometimes when your your team is working uh, sometimes a, a logic goes out the window so we have to train that and that you know comes down to uh, identifying right when this is happening and then immediately acting on it don't let things escalate to a point where it gets out of control especially even you know some silly things like oh my god i've been waiting for an hour and you hear that in the waiting room well guess what when well, there's 15 other people waiting in the waiting room and one one person says i've been waiting for an hour guess what everybody else starts to think right yeah like, oh my god it's all this negative stuff in their head so um, we identify it um you know depending on what the case is we make sure that we take that patient into a private area, whether it be an exam room, you know, special testing room somewhere, right? Uh, sit them down. Uh, next, you have to have empathy, right? So the first thing is, is I am so sorry, right? We want to be on the side of the patient. You can't take a defensive view, even if you're doing everything in your power to do things right. And it's hard when someone's telling you you're doing something wrong when you feel you're doing something right. So you just have to kind of put the ego aside and um, be on their side with it and try and work through the issue and solve the problem no matter what um, unless it's something obviously that you don't want to solve because it's going against the law or something like that and that's just goes without saying but um 99 percent of the time we can solve the problem after you solve the problem uh, you know you solve it fast and yeah you can lose money on those things that's perfectly fine we've lost hundreds of dollars thousands of dollars uh over the years that's for sure and it's fine uh, you want to keep that patient you want to realize they have a family that comes to you things like that um and then afterward uh it's a great learning tool for your team uh, it needs to be discussed after what that issue was and how to resolve those types of problems. Put in a protocol so that that doesn't happen again. Now you can't have 10 million protocols, but even just these little principles that you can, you know, write down uh, helps helps your team for the next time something like that happens. Just like it's back to the uh, model of the patient always seems happy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Kalana, getting back to uh, the practice standpoint, what would you say are the pros and cons versus independent and corporate optometry? You know, for independent optometry, it allows you to practice according to your vision for your company. 
Okay. Um, and they both they both have places. You know, it, it's not that there's. I'm not going to sit here and say one's better than another. I, I think it depends on the type of person you are. One might be more of a, a corporate setting type person, and one more, might be more of a private setting. You know, so you as an individual and knowing what your goals are uh, for for where you want to be down the road is really important. You know, I myself am, and John are are very like visionary where we want we see where we're going with things and what we want to do and we like to control all aspects of the business you know where corporate in a setting works very well especially if you're maybe just getting out of school and you're not sure if you want to go into owning your own practice but i know there's a lot of pressure on corporate optometry right now because what's happening in our industry is corporate optometry is getting pressured on the retail side. So the doctor doesn't own the retail part of things. Right. And retail is getting, those areas are getting pressure from online sales. Okay, so what's happening is the online sales are affecting the optical side of corporate optometry. So what happens is, whoever that might be that owns the optical side, then puts pressure on the doctor by raising their fees, rents, or leases, depending on their agreement. So they don't have much say in what goes on. They don't. You know, uh, they could close you. You know, there's stores that are going bankrupt, right? So, so, you're, right? so, you're, right? so if they go bankrupt, well, now that practice that you're involved in inside the Sears is no longer there. You know, so I like to dictate my own future. So if I'm going to mess up and John's going to mess up, we're going to do it ourselves. On you, right? right. Uh, and then if we could see the ship not going where we want it to, we could change course, right? Where if you're in the, the other one, you don't have as much control, and you're, you know, you're kind of in between. It's like I want to make this decision, but I can't. Uh, so it, it depends on you as a person and what you feel comfortable with. But then the other side of it is for corporate optometry because that is getting squeezed going to work in group practice because we are seeing a, you know, a surge in, in groups coming together of optometrists with different specialties and that's what we've put together over the years and it works phenomenal not only for the doctors but also for the patients because we have different specialties inside of the same practice. It probably allows you to do more for the patient and allows you to maybe grow the business maybe in a little better of an aspect providing more for the patient. It does. And we, we spend time with all of our doctors because we know what their strengths are and what their interests are. So we try to work with them on if they're trying to add something new from their point of view, from an educational point, and from the patient's point of view. You know, where you might have that tied a little bit in the corporate set. Oh, all right. That's a good thing to think about. Um, so Dr. Mondo, um, when you graduated from our optometry school and decided to buy this practice, um, how did you know what steps to take you know, like who to, who to hire, you know, where do you, where do you find these people, who to hire, how do you go about billing, insurance, setting up the appointments, just basically setting up the practice, like, so I'll be coming out of school in a few years, and from that standpoint, how do you know, like, I'm going to open up this practice, I'm going to meet this person, I'm going to meet that person, how do you figure out which different departments you need? Yeah, you, you don't know. In the very <laughs> uh, and and, he, and uh, getting out, you are a lot of those departments. Um, you know, you're going to be the one that has to learn how to do the billing first. Uh, you're going to be the one that's going to be throwing the garbage out every night, right? right. Um, all of that is uh, amazing, okay? Right. Um, it's not a negative thing. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's maybe one of the most important things that you can ever do is to learn. You already know how to be a doctor's tech. Right? You know, you can do every one of those things, right? Um, you already know pretty much how to be an optical salesperson or, you know, uh, maybe not grind lenses, but you're not going to be grinding lenses maybe right off the bat. Um, you know, you want to start leaning the lean um, and don't think fancy. In the beginning, a lot of doctors go in and they're like, oh, well, I want to buy a $100,000 this and uh, that and all that. But if you don't have patience to start, especially if you're opening cold, I mean, we were fortunate where we had a patient base. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that, that's kind of a tough question because it depends on the route you want to go with that. 
Um, but uh, yeah, as far as the building goes, you need to learn that in and out first. Um, and uh, you know, as far as frame and lens ordering and things like that, you could also use a lot of your reps to help you with those things. So your frame reps, your uh, your lab that you use. Uh, you know, we went when, uh, early on. They they had they brought us there, showed us what they do. Um, so you can learn how to do orders through the people who work in your lab. They will walk you through things. Same with contact lenses. Right. There's a lot of people out there that will help you because they know you're going to be giving them money pretty soon, right? right? So they're there, <laughs> all of their frames and lenses and things like that. Um, so they're willing to help, and you need to use that. You need to create a really strong team around you. Um, you know, think like family instead of fancy, I guess, right? So. So, Dr. Kalana, uh, where do you uh, suggest going to find people that you do need to hire? Let's say the staff is low, or you find that you need to grow in certain areas. What, uh, what kind of steps do you take to find that person that you need to hire? So, I would say we we are always looking for good people, whether we have openings or not. You know, John and I are, are big believers in, in hiring for the person, that we can always train the skills through the programs that we have in place. You know, through our online training and, and so forth. So we we're looking for the right person, a good person who's going to come in and provide great customer service with a smile, and also fit in with the team, right? Because we take care of our patients as a team, and and that's really important to us. So you know, waiters, waitresses, retail. Uh, uh, those those are are people that they kind of step up in certain circumstances. They kind of stand out in a restaurant, and we have no problems with giving them a card and telling them they're ever looking for a change or a daytime job. And and if they ever thought about being in the medical, you know, industry, uh, I think our best hire uh, still to this date is. Uh, Everybody's been a great hire, I shouldn't say that. Uh, but to give you an example of where you would not think, but you know, the va- we used to go to, and we still go to a restaurant, and the valet person there, the checkout person, uh, always was smiling. It didn't matter if it was 11 o'clock at night or, or always pleasant, uh, always chatted with us and did a great job. And we hired her here, and she's one of our uh, better, if not, you know, top technicians here at the office. So you, you always need to be on the lookout for a good person that presents themselves well. First impressions do make a difference. You know, you hear all the time, it's not all of it. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's 99% of it, right? Uh, you got to come back a long way if you don't give a great first impression. And uh, so we're always on the lookout for those types of people wherever we are when we're traveling and, and so forth. And uh, it's just being open to, to different ideas and meeting new people all the time. They always say you can judge someone's success by how many hands they shake. Because that means you're meeting new people, you're networking, and that's how you find great people to help you elevate your, your business. Gotcha. So I guess for both of you, it's uh, you. You more so, more so outsource your, um, like you, you like go through other people versus like outsourcing. You know, some people put out flyers, some people put ads on Facebook or things like that. You would say you would more or less go through the people that you know, right? Or just go out, go to dinner. Yeah, you know, and you seek them out almost. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because as you get older and you start going to these restaurants or anywhere, you go to the mall and you know you're at Starbucks, you're right. somewhere. And, Someone is just a little different than everybody else. You'll notice, you know, and they're like, "Well, they need to be with us." Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And so, how do you, um, Dr. Kalana, <laughs> how would you go ahead and uh, figure out how to pay each position? Sure. You know, that's something we got up and down on uh, in a number of years in the beginning of our career. You know, we tried the have a lot of people and pay a little bit less right. to have more volume of allowed for our patients. So we tried that for a while, and then we went with, John came up with the idea, how about we have less people and we pay them more, so we get more productivity, uh, you know, on behalf of the patients and so forth. If there's not an exact science or answer to that question, because I think it depends on the type of practice you have. You know, if you have a 
a higher end practice where you do more revenue per patient and there needs to be a little bit more personalization and hand holding. It depends on the actual location and neighborhood your practice is in, you know, um, because that dictates how you're going to set up your staff a little bit, you know, as far as that. So, you know, we do have national norms of what each position pays based on how long and how much experience they have in that area. So we use those as guidelines and we do provide that to our clients and so forth. But, you know, we're not very big on the, you're a technician and every year you get a raise because you're doing the same work you were before. We, we, we tried that concept for years. And it, it kind of became a, well, I'm here for years, I should have, should get a raise. Kind of thing. We changed that to more of a performance-based system where we base it how much you make on how many skills you know. And it also helps us enhance our culture going forward because people know that if they're learning new skills and adding to them, it's bettering them as an individual, but it's also helping us take care of the patients better, right? So that's how we kind of judge things when we look at someone that we're looking to hire, how many skills they know, and that could be beneficial to the patient and to the practice. And, and that's how we kind of go about things, you know. So we've gone away from the automatic kind of entitlement, I've been here five years and I should just get X. We were not believers in that. Have you determined how you take yourself, how you should go about versus how much you deserve versus how much you should pay. Like, yeah, I'm sure that's a very difficult to figure out. Yeah, very, uh, I mean, that the, the numbers in it, there is a practice net that you should be around a percentage. I mean, you want, to, you want to be around that 30% practice net. Now, practice net here is all of the doctors, okay? Uh, and then, you know, as the owners, we take a percentage of that 30%. But if you're the only doctor in the practice, then that 30% is all yours. The thing is, is that you have to build up to that, right? So in the very beginning, uh, you, you, you may be getting 0%. <laughs> you might be getting 5%. But the goal, once you start coming along, uh, you really should be at that, you know, that 30% mark of your entire gross revenue. So, you know, if your gross revenue is a hundred thousand dollars, then you would be making thirty thousand dollars. If your gross revenue is six hundred thousand dollars, then you would be making about a hundred thousand dollars, right? So, and so um I'm sure everybody knows the technology is really easy to do this profession mm -hmm. and uh my observation I see a lot of doctors take the optimist replacing that with a dilated pharmacy exam. Mm -hmm. I just want to know, what, what, are your, what are the pros and cons? What is your mm -hmm. I think the Optos uh, technology is, is a great thing. You know, we've had one in the office here, and we have clients that have them. You know, so it is definitely, the more you could add to your patient's care, obviously, is beneficial. You know, at, at, at the end of the day, we always go back to what's the standard of care in our industry decided by the board and AOA. And still, if you look at the standard of care, there's nothing written that says the optos is acceptable to replace in an office dilation. So, from a liability standpoint, as business owners and as, as doctors, you know, we went to school for all these years, we want to protect our license, right? So, the standard of care, according to the AOA, is still a in office dilation. Now, the patient could defer that and you could provide them the optos. And as long as you educate the patient and they make the choice on their own health and you document that, uh, document is key. Document is, is really important that they're deferring that in-office dilation in place of the optos. Well, you're protecting your, yourself, your license, and your practice, right? So, so I'm not going to say at this point that we choose that instead of, you know, uh, because we gear it towards protecting the patient care and our practice from a business standpoint, our license, you know. Could it be in the, in the future? It's possible. There's great technology that provides great information in numerous types of areas for our patients, you know. 
And I think we do have to embrace that technology as we go forward to provide better care. But it wouldn't, at this point, replace anything for, for us in our office or any of our... Do you think, like, do you think that it would, it would save time if the, the, the patient were to be okay with it? Do you think that, um, that the office machine, that type of technology, saves time or gives you a better view mm -hmm. versus doing a dialing exam? Uh, I like the Optimap. Uh, I feel as though, in a lot of ways, it could be more accurate than the dilated fundus exam because it really captures all one view, um, whereas you're moving and the patient's eyes moving. And I, I understand that there are a lot of, you know, there might be some cowboy optometrists that say that they're better than the, than the Optimap, and that's fine. Um, I think doing, doing both um, is great. Um, you know, either way, uh, you know, you can do the best dilated fundus exam in the world. If you miss something, the patient has it, it doesn't matter, right? Um, they could technically still sue you, even though they said, wow, I did this, or you missed it. So uh, I think having that as a backup is very nice. Uh, you know, either way, if you miss it, whether it's on the Optimap or whether you're doing the dilated fundus exam, um, you're going to get caught. Uh, so it's just a matter of, you know, to me, it's not necessarily either or. It's, uh, maybe it, it's a very good tool to have. And uh, what would you say uh, your opinion on this growth, lifestyle, things and such of somebody who owns either, whether it's a group, solo, artifact, at one location? versus somebody that owns uh, multiple practices? Mm -hmm. Well, for owning multiple locations, you almost have to look at it as it's, it's multiple businesses, right? So it's it's the same field, right? But obviously, the mental decisions are going to multiply, right? And I think it depends on the person's spirit. Are you an entrepreneur? Are you not? Uh, do you want to make it personal, smaller practice in the community where you're going to be seeing the patients all the time. You know, you have to trust delegation if you're trying to go to multiple locations. You have to, it, takes, it took us a long time. You know, we had delegation in place, but we didn't fully release the reins to delegation. You know, and that's a hard transition to make. Now, it's, it's probably, it's the best thing we've ever done because it's allowed us to grow in what we're doing, right? Because uh, you cannot do everything yourself, and you accomplish so much more with great people around you than you would if you just sat there by yourself and made all the decisions. You know, you can't just be, I know everything, I have one mindset. If you really want to grow and have multiple locations, well, you need to have other people involved and other sources of information. Then you can make the best decision for what you're trying to do, you know, as far as that. So it depends on the person's spirit. Are you a little bit more for a personal, in-house, I need to control everything? Or are you okay with delegating and running it more like a true business or company than just a job that you have to own the business? Would you say that um, in group practice by the sorrow, would you say that a bad practice has a lower cap versus one that has multiple locations? Is there any limitations? So I think it depends on if you need a financial cap. Eventually, you will reach a rooftop if you're in a small solo practice, right? Uh, in our industry, the average doctor does between six hundred to seven fifty or eight hundred thousand dollars in gross revenue, average, based on you know the historical statistics out there, depending on the area that you're practicing in. Uh, a higher grossing revenue for one doctor would do about a million, okay, of a, of a higher producing. Uh, we know some practices that do much more than a million for solo practitioners, you know, one, three, one, four, right? But that, again, is, is gonna, you're going to hit a roof there, right? Because you can only do so much yourself. Where if you go into that group setting and you take it and you have, like us, we have numerous doctors that work for us, and you start taking five doctors seeing patients full time, well, and they're doing a million dollars each, well, then you're sitting at a $5 million practice. 
right? Now your net revenue might go down as the owner percentage wise, but your dollar amount you're going to make smaller percentage of more money is more than a higher percentage of less money, right? Uh, so that's how I kind of approach if you're looking from the financial point of view of things, you know? Lifestyle wise, it can be very challenging to be practicing by yourself. You know, in the beginning, for only the two of us, we our net vacation was zero over the first three years. He would go on vacation, I'd work for his time and see his patient. I'd go on vacation, he'd see my patient, so net was zero. You know? Now that made us get to this point though. You know, I'm not devaluing that at all. I mean you need to develop that work ethic in the beginning. You need to be open when the patients want to come in. You know, uh, that's what we signed up for when we went to school to provide care to patients, right? Caregiving, you have to be available for them when they need to come in, you know. Uh, and then but that's, that's a rough topic in our industry right now. So some people are like, it's got to be on my time. That's fine. It could be on your time. But you have to be okay of you're going to make less on the other end on your time. You know, so you got to try to meet in the middle and decide what your personal goals are. So going back to um, just hiring things and stuff. In the Google Owens places, you see that they have a nice smile and they're good for working with the practical coverage very well. What, what steps do you go about in the interview process to ensure the term of life is a good for your practice and whether to have the most good owners to grow your practice? Yeah, the biggest thing is, is to make sure that they are the type of person that aligns with core values of the practice, um, whatever they are. So you're going to have your own, you know, core values. We have our own, um, and you have to make sure that, like we were discussing before, to hire the person, um, that that person needs to align with those core values. So you know, the core values of Westminster Eye Care. Um, our first one is, is to make sure that we perform excellent patient care. Um, our second one is to serve. Uh, honestly and passionately our local community uh, and our third one is to maintain great office culture so as long as this person who we're hiring follows and aligns themselves with those values um, from there everything else can be trained uh, and, uh, and, and that's really how it goes but if they don't align with those from the beginning uh, you can guarantee that they won't be there So if we're uh, once somebody does get there on practice, you know, they're slowly building up and you decide what vendors to use. I'm sure a lot of them have options, but I'm, I'm sure that at some point they're going to try and you know, increase prices and get in your doctor. You, know, you don't have that kind of experience, you know, okay, they charge me this much, but they have some, you know, you see numbers falling all around, but you don't have much experience. So how do you go about determining which vendor to use? Right. Well, similar to the hiring process, we almost apply that, what John just spoke about, with the core values to the vendors we work with. You know, so we want to work with companies that have similar core values that we So you're again trying to align yourself with people that their goals are similar to your goals, right? And, and that's really important to us. So from that aspect, we do meet with the reps or the companies and we use our years of experience, and if you don't have years of experience, whether you have a mentor or someone that you could rely on and just say, you know, what do you think of this company, what do you, you know, that's really important, you know, because I know there's numerous doctors out there that want to give back and help students and new docs out there and, and continue to take our profession to the next level, you know, so it's almost a hiring process with the vendors, you know, from the ph pharmaceutical companies, uh, and contact lens companies, frames and lenses. John and I used to try everything. Now, you know, they come in and say, oh, this, this, you know, eye drop does not burn. Really? We would put it in our eyes, right? Because we need to experience that so we can communicate that to the patients. That's really, so we would do that with contacts. We would put the contacts on our eyes, we would try them for whatever, and so we get that experience with it, right? Now, it doesn't mean that we have the two of us, so it's a little easier to, to get two opinions on it, right? Uh, but that's how we would handle different things, you know, and from frames, 
when they say, oh, these are really adorable, you know, you give them to the kids. You give them to the kids and let them play with them. And if they're broke in 10 minutes, well, that's what's going to happen in real life, right? So you almost develop your own case study on the vendors, the values, and their products and going forward on things. And you need to keep yourself educated about things that are coming out to better take care of the patients, whether it's in glaucoma, nitrogen, or any of these other issues. So it's a combination of a little bit of experience and, and trial and error by you when you get out and see what you really think about certain things. It's a great point. I want to know if you have a problem. So the new guy, optometrist, um, you know, if you were out for time, what are the benefits uh, that we can uh, give to these students that are graduating? Yeah. You know, our, our student network, network is, is a great thing. I mean, uh, we're very happy to have and communicate with students that are coming out and trying to better our, our profession. And that's what we're all about, preserving independent optometry and helping students make the transition from getting a great education medically in school to going in and running a business because we're not taught that, right? So we're there to help that transition. So we start out with placement if needed. So we can help you be placed in an office that's looking to hire a doctor. Uh, Align again with where you're looking to practice and your values of where you want to be. If you want to be in a medically oriented practice, we take that into account. If it's more optical and so forth, you know. So that's one thing that we really try to focus on. We try to give, and we do provide financial guidance because there's a lot of financial questions that are out there. Now, it's not only just us. We do have, you know, CPAs and financial advisors that give that certified information. But if you're just trying to decide, what do I do with my student loans? What do I do with my credit card bill? How do I approach that? You know, those are discussions we like to just talk through and help them in this transition period. If they're looking to buy in, like we discussed, into a practice, or if they're looking to buy an existing practice or cold start, we help actually talk through these conversations because they're two very different areas. You know, buying an existing practice, which, yes, you are getting sometimes dated equipment and dated decor sometimes because things sometimes don't aren't kept up the way a new grad would like them to be. You know, but there are benefits to that. You do have existing patients coming in, in a book. Financing is much easier through a bank and we do help align our students when they're transitioning to getting financing for buying an established practice. Much easier because it's based on the business's revenue of the past couple of years. If you're trying to cold start, we do help with that. But it's a very different financial issue because a bank is not going to lend you money because you have no revenue coming. So we need to have different discussions with that depending on what you're trying to do, you know. Uh, so that, those are the things that we provide. We do also coaching uh, roundtable discussions to try to get you around other doctors as we're growing uppercut. We're doing small regional uh, roundtables and workshops throughout the country where we're not only having upper cut clients, but we're having potentials for some students that are coming to sit in and spend a day with us and hear from different ideas. So that's what we're bringing to the table to try to transition students into expanding optometry and independent optometry in the future. I think it's a beautiful thing with basically the placement of a business that should be incorporated in the school. That's what you guys know you're doing to secure the success stories. Yeah, don't, don't be afraid to open cold. Don't be afraid to buy a practice. It's one of the greatest things you'll ever do. I know there's always questions in the back of students' heads, you know, can I do this, can I do this? If you're thinking about doing it, do it. Um, really, it's, it's you know, one of the greatest roles we have. So, yes, we still have. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.